Lord, we thank you that it brings life to us. And we just thank you, God, for that life, Lord, here this morning. Mold us and shape us and change us. We just thank you, God, for doing your work on our lives here this morning. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen. amen. <clears throat> you know, we're going to find that in uh, the book of Joshua is at a moment in time that, um, I, I don't know, it's, it's kind of, Joshua 24, maybe you've heard, if, if you've been in church long enough, you've heard messages about the Joshua generation, or definitely we know about, you know, we've heard of Moses once or twice if you've been here, but, um, you know, the supernatural life that they lived day and night in the wilderness, leaving Egypt and going into the promised land, seeing God's strong, mighty power crumble walls that were impossible to overcome by the hand of man, and, and they did it not with the weapons made of man's hand, but they did it with a shout, which is so amazing. And, and, you know, we've lived in different, there's different generations represented here this morning. There's different people that have been raised at different times, different experiences. You've been a part of different moves of God um, that, that we can go back and recall that just incredible times. But living in the day of Joshua, to see all those wonders, the signs and wonders that they saw, you know, it would make you feel pretty good that you were on the winning side. You know, when they got to Jericho, Jericho was caught up in that city. They were actually afraid. They were in fear. They were pretty upset because they had heard of the, uh, of the God of Israel and what they did to the leading power of Egypt in that day, completely annihilating the leading power. Um, and, and they were the ones that were the slaves. And so the, the testimony of what God had done had even gone before them. Is that pretty cool? They went before them so that when they sent in spies, you know, they're already, they were nervous when they hear that the ones that devastated Egypt have now come up to our city and, and they were so afraid, even though Israel had thought that they were like grasshoppers in their sight, the enemy had a different thought and a viewpoint than what they thought of themselves. And, and that's something in our life today uh, on the intimidation that we feel. If we really understood what the enemy's thoughts and views of the enemies that we're going through in our life. You know, the snake is definitely represented a lot, and we're afraid of the snake, but the snakes only bite usually out of fear. You know, if you come across them, right? If you've ever been out in the woods, if you've ever been hunting, if you ever, snakes usually don't just go looking to attack people. If you come into their territory, usually, you, you know, my, my dad would always tell me um, <laughs> that, that it's the first one that wakes up the snake and the second one that gets bit. He'd always tell me that while he was leading the way in the woods. And so, um, you know, it, the, the enemy's viewpoint of us is completely different than the way we even feel about us. And so even in that light, so I want you just to think with me what it must have been like to see God's supernatural hand just moving throughout all of their life. And yet it still comes to a point where we find in Joshua chapter uh, 24. Verse 14, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. Powerful proclamation, but yet did he really have to say it? He, he wouldn't be declaring this if he didn't have to. Do you follow me? Like there were still people battling with idol worship somehow, some way, are the thought of it. Now, you've just seen your God completely come through time and time again, yet we still find Joshua standing in the midst of the people of, of Israel. And now, verse 15, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, 
Choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that are on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites and whose land that you dwell. But as for me and my house, he said, you guys, whatever it is to you, if it seems evil to you, that's fine, that's on you. But I'm going to tell you, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're serving the God, the God uh, of, our, uh, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're serving the God, uh, and it's for me and my house. And he has to say it, which confuses me, because I would think it would be an easy decision, right? Yet still to this day, we find ourselves plenty of times tempted on, on whether what we're submitting to or what we're giving our attention to. And, and we still have to revisit this decision of our life. And in and a, <laughs> a time now more than ever, we have to make this decision on, as for me and my house, we will, we will serve the Lord. Because I don't know if you've recognized or noticed, but in a short period of, uh, of years here, we've seen a transition in our nation to where you can't be lazy about raising your children and your household. Because the moment, if you're not leading them, somebody else will. And you cannot put your confidence in Hollywood. You can't put your confidence in YouTube, Google. Uh, they're out there searching plenty of interesting facts to come up and, with, with, their, with their ideologies and, and these different things. And, and listen, the, the, the statistic of children being raised in church, that actually that it sticks that when they move out, it's so alarming. It's actually, I don't even really want to go there, but over 90%, once they leave, and, and if they, once they go, they survive. We're talking they've survived. You have survived the teenage years. If you can do that, that's a testimony. Can I hear an amen to any moms and dads? You survived that. But once they go away to college, they get these, uh, uh, they're not going to Bible college, all right? Let me just tell you that right now. Um, if they can survive that and all the, the liberal teachings and, and viewpoints um, that they literally have a hard time keeping their faith even in the universities after they've moved out of your house. So you have to be very... <laughs> it goes against culture, right? It goes against even these different mentalities. Some people say, well, well my parents made me go to church and I'm not going to do that to my kids. Well, I would have thought you would have learned a little bit um, better than that because you're a fool. <laughs> and I can say that because my parents made me go to church, drug me to church. I'm talking like in today's day and age, if you go to church once or twice a month, you're considered a member and, and you're going to church. When I grew up, that was considered backslidden. I'm sorry. That's a, like that was backslidden. You were like concerned. What's going on? We went... Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. Three times a week following the Lord. Culture is shifting in such a way that, that you think that you don't want to intrude on your son and your daughter's room. It's their room. Are you kidding me? Do they pay the bills? Do they pay for that stuff? So that ain't your room nothing. Don't you lock your door and I'm going to come in. It's not abusive. It's not a dictator. It's called, I'm making sure, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Now, maybe you don't have children. Your children are raised. And they've grown up and moved out. Uh, that doesn't exclude you. Like, we have a household that still, you can still help your children who live in another state and helping to disciple them. Now, at that point... It's not that you're trying to make them do anything, but you can encourage them. You can actually use social media for an encouraging tool. I know it's hard to believe, but you could do it. You could be sending them. There's different apps out there that they have Bible studies or scripture verses that you can send to them on a regular basis just to remind them why they're in another state. You know, uh, maybe it's set up on an automatic system, but they don't know that. They think you're thinking about them every day, and you just send it out, and they're like, oh, Mom, oh, Dad, thank you. But it's these little things that if you do it, will make a big difference. That, that's ways that you can still, um, you know, you still have power at Thanksgiving when they come to visit, right? You still have power um, at Easter, you know. Um, you can use those manipulating powers to get them to church, you know, if you have to on Easter. Um, 
All joking aside, though, it's important. When we look at the life, uh, even in Scripture, so much of the focus and attention to what should be uh, on church in the book of Acts was really the birth of the New Testament church that, that we are today, that we have amazing revelation that the church is the bride of Christ, that yet before any of Acts chapter 2, God already instituted and created the family. And the family is older than the church. This is the importance of family and the way God views family. And when God uses the lineage, He's not just interested in a relationship with you. But He is the God not just of Abraham, but He's the God of Isaac and He's the God of Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're talking a generational God. We're talking that when you make a decision to follow after God, whether you realize it, your children can balk, they can fight you. I know I never would have complained to my parents about going to church three times a week, but my sister did all the time. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, um, so, so they can complain and they can be a brat. Those blessings can be such a brat, you know, um, but you do it anyways. Amen. I've said it before. You've heard my testimonies. I, I would say, I remember mom and dad, I don't feel good. And the only problem was we went to a church that believed in healing. And they didn't care. And I got stains in the back seat of the car when I threw up um, on the way to church to prove it. <laughs> right? And, and so this is the importance of family and the importance of... Uh, <laughs> this is the importance when one generation decides to follow after God. We know of Joseph as the dreamer, the one that interprets dreams, the one that shifted nations because of his relationship with God. But it wasn't because Joseph was just so gifted. It wasn't because Joseph was just so special, even though his father made him a coat of many colors. But Joseph came from a family of dreamers. If you've ever thought for a moment, Joseph dreaming didn't start there, but it started back at his father and his grandfather. His grandfather having dreams. His grandfather having encounters with God. His grandfather, Abraham, launching out into places that, that wherever they are to go, you can see, I'm going to lead you to take you to a place where you're supposed to go. And Abraham, he had to leave, and he had to go out, and he had to do something that was crazy in that day. It was so crazy. And yet we find Isaac. Let's look at Isaac had encounter after encounter with God. Maybe it kind of goes unnoticed with the spectacular of Abraham and, and with the spectacular of, of Jacob. But, but Isaac... He had encounters with God. He literally had encounters with God that he began to inform him that I am the God of your father Abraham and just as I was with him, I'm going to be with you. And he has uh, more than one encounter with God. And, he, and Isaac's going through this thing. Uh, Jacob, you know, you know, Abraham wasn't the only one in the story leading up to the mountain to sacrifice his only son. Who's the other person in the story? This isn't a trick question. <laughs> Abraham isn't the only one in the story leading up to the mountain to sacrifice his son. There was somebody else. Isaac was with Abraham. And as they're climbing up, he's old enough to go, Dad, I see the preparations for the sacrifice, but where's the sacrifice? He's old enough to know what's going on. Hey, Dad, I know that I'm your promise and you've prayed for me and believed for me your whole life. And, and you've got to be pretty happy if mom and dad that, that couldn't have you and then supernaturally had you. Talk about being the favorite one. He had, he had a brother. And we don't even get into that. That's another sermon. Ishmael. But, but he had to go up there and lay down his life on the altar. 
He had to be a part of that. And we see families making decisions that went from family line on down to the next generation, on down to the next generation, to when we get to Joseph, he's operating in dreams because he comes from a family line that have had encounters with God and they tell their children, God appeared to me, God spoke to me, God's led me to this place. We have this relationship with God. So at every generation, it gets to the place Place that when Joseph is young, he's having dreams with God. It doesn't just happen. It's because there was somebody in the family that said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And yet, after Joshua made this statement and passed away, it said there rose up another generation that did not know God. One generation is all that it takes. Send them off to one university and watch how they battle with how they put down uh, the scriptures and the faith of Christianity. Watch how they belittle them. It's important that they know what they believe because they're going to be tested on it. And it's not that we're not loving or accepting, but, but at the same time, when we believe a truth, it's okay to say, this ain't right. You can legislate it. You can, you can you know, make it to where it's the common thing. And let me tell you something. Disney ain't on your side. They're coming out with shows now that are crazy. So when we say, as for me and my house, I can't rely even on the educational system to disciple them on what they believe, that I've got to do it. And we see through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that they poured in. If you don't have kids, let me tell you what we have. We have juvenile diversion. We have, we have the gate student ministries. If you're wondering, I don't know, that's great, Pastor Greg, but I don't have any kids, I got plenty of kids that you can help out. Plenty of kids. Faith factories, uh, the gate, and then we have juvenile diversion where they need some influences of adult leadership and the life to help lead them and guide them. There's plenty of opportunity that you say, we're going to serve God, not just in church, but he said, my house. More than the church service on Sunday, this is what I live. Because the kids watch how you live. The kids repeat words that you say. You think because pastors don't hear you cussing, we hear you cussing when your kids are cussing. <laughs> we, hear, we hear the slip-ups and we know how you talk. Because it's not how you live at church, but they watch how you live at home. And that's why he's saying, as for me and my house, at home, how important it is. Not that we have to be perfect, but when we make a mistake, can we show our children what it's like to turn it around? We don't have to be perfect. Can anybody say amen to that? Hallelujah. That's a wonderful testimony. But we can say, look, I made a mistake. Look, I, I shouldn't have... I shouldn't have lost my temper and yelled at your mother like that. I, I, uh, I know she wouldn't listen, but I still shouldn't have done it. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Do you have a testimony? Baby. If you have kids that are here, um, they are all anxiously awaiting to do something in the second service. Um, they'll be sick over the whole second service. They do have to leave. Um, you'll be able to grab them. But you have to still go and get them. They can hang out with us in the faith factory for a little while longer. Um, and then an ice cream truck is going up, and there's free ice cream for adults, kids, everybody. Whoa, 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 whoa. For adults, too. Free ice cream. Do they have Do they have vanilla bean with cho with chocolate brownies?
if you'd like. You can leave. You can leave. Or okay. if you have somebody now, you can come get them. But okay. the You're not holding them hostage. Good. As the worship team comes. So when we're living our life, you, know, you take those opportunities and those moments with your children to love, to discipline, and not just to tell them what they're doing wrong, but why it's wrong or, or even the different things. I, I could walk in. Now, my son, Judah, he's playing a video game online. Um, if you have any discretion over what I allow for my children, you just email me at Pastor Sandy at gatewayfamilychurch.com. <laughs> but it, it's this game called Fortnite. And you've probably never heard of it if you have kids. So, uh, so, but he's on there, and I'm always stop. You know, you don't know these people online. You just can't tell them who your name is and where you live. You know, again, you're helping your kids out because you know. But he'll be on there, and he's talking to these strangers as if, you know, they're just friends, or he's just he's not shy about it at all. And it's this little boy, it's this little kid talking like he's so cool and such an adult. But I could hear him talk. He's like, so are you a Christian? <laughs> and here he is. And, and I'm listening. And this other kid, and, and the other kid said, I'm a Christian. He's like, oh, good, good. I'm glad you are, man. Because, and him and his other friend are sitting here and listening to them witness to somebody online. I think that's kind of cool, you know? And, and I never said, hey, Judah, when you get on there, would you lead somebody to Jesus? For, you know, hey, Judah, let's use this as an evangelism tool. But I sit back and I'm blessed because I see that something inside of him that he also got from his brother that would sit there and actually try to lead people, even on an online gaming where it may not be a sweet game. Um, <laughs> it's a competitive game. But yet you see that happening. Now, look, I, I'm not trying to just share, present him as... I've also had to get on to him, too, because, you know, you don't know that person. Don't tell them where you live. Don't tell them your name. Don't tell them all this. Uh, but everybody's standing. There's something about when your children see how you are driving in the car, when your family sees how you are, when you don't agree with the pastor, when your family sees how you are, they notice, they recognize, and they're learning more so by observation than by even what we say. And so, Father, we just ask for your help, your instruction, your leading, and your guidance. As we live in a day and an age, now more than ever before, of raising up our families, pouring into the lives of our brothers, our sisters, our parents, our uncles, our, our family members, oh God. We just thank you, Lord, for leading in such a way that we build a relationship, God, with you and our children and our children's children as a result of the way that we live. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said, amen. As the ministry team and pastors make their way up to the front, if you have any special prayer requests here this morning, we just invite you to step out of your seat. You make your way up here to the front. Whether you want to surrender your heart to Jesus, healing in your body, or just prayer for something happening in life, then we invite you to step out of your seat now as we worship.